hi, I'm Colin Griffin. Uh, so I run uh, Crumware. I'm chief engineer there uh, and a founder as well. Um, Crumb specializes uh, first in application delivery, but we've grown into a platform engineering world that's taken us into uh, requiring us to have full understanding of IT ops developers and their tools, um, uh, full infrastructure administrative teams. Uh, we're experts in Kubernetes, containers, everything infrastructure uh, because of that. Um, and we use Terraform as a part of our stack. Um, so we're augmenting this a little bit, again, because you need to understand the foundations of Terraform uh, in order to run through the first portion of our workshop. But we're going to take it to another level uh, and take it to a little bit further. Um, one of the important reasons we run this particular workshop for teams, and we do it typically with companies that want to bring uh, multifunctional groups of people together, whether it's DevSecOps and SecOps and then uh, IT infrastructure or or core dev, core infrastructure, whatever you want to call um, your teams, it gives them an opportunity to work together to, to understand each other's tools. So we're actually going to cover GitOps approaches, um, as well as uh, Terraform, and then also Argo CD for uh, the build and deployment side of applications as well. So a lot of this uh, covers the same fundamental concepts underneath the hood, especially from a clone and push uh, or clone and pull or automated clone and pull standpoint. So we're going to chat through that. Um, this is the QR code for this uh, slide deck itself. There's a ton of extra stuff in there that we're probably going to skip through a little bit depending on people's competencies, but feel free to hang on to that and come back to that later. Um, quick remark about the uh, repositories and tools that we'll be using. Everything that we use today, we can keep. Uh, there is nothing subscription-based uh, in this workshop. Um, the repos we'll be referencing are public, and as a matter of fact, you will be forking our repositories uh, as a part of this as well. The intention is to set you guys up with something that you have in hand that you've already used before that you can continue, continue to use if you so choose to. All right, so uh, this is Cremware. Uh, so we're essentially a software development consultancy. We develop technology and applications and then train developers and infrastructure folks in place in those tools so that they don't have to invent. They can learn through manipulate, uh, manipulation. All right, quick forward. Thank you guys for being here. I know it's toward the end of the day for SIBA uh, Navigate. It's been an awesome conference. I'm exhausted already as well. Um, so give me a little bit of grace also in case I stumble on something. But uh, another thing, uh, ask questions. Um, and then also uh, thank you to our partners. So we're a big uh, SUSE partner as well. So you're going to be seeing Rancher uh, today as well for part of your the click ops portion of your workflow. Um, and huge thank you to Sivo for uh, having me out here. Uh, let's see. So this is our uh, rough schedule. We're going to talk a little bit about platform engineering and platform concepts. Uh, it's very, very, very important uh, to me. I'm a member of the platforms working group at the CNCF, um, and it's a it's an important concept that's evolving and it's hitting a little bit of a hype cycle uh, right now as well. We have a lot of good stuff coming at, uh, at KubeCon this year, but this gives you the tools you need for that as well. Then we're going to cover uh, platform and tool prep preparation. That's where the Terraform really comes in. You'll be cloning our repo with our Terraform definitions. Uh, modules, yep. Uh, and then we will be, uh, we're also going to be installing Terraform as a part of that. And usually folks need a little bit of help, uh, at least getting that installed. Um, through that, it requires us to actually get an account on Sivo, uh, which we have a landing page set up that lets you create an account without a credit card, anything else. So it's a streamlined part of this workshop. Um, and it also gives you enough credits to run this stuff for 30 days. Then we're going to deploy our platform tools using Terraform. Uh, that's going to install things like Argo. We're going to deploy the app. And then we'll go into the second half of this, and we'll take a break um, in case anyone needs to step out and you don't want to get to that portion. But uh, we're going to cover uh, Argo CD, uh, GitOps from an application standpoint, and everything that we do from an app dev standpoint, we're not going to be touching Helm or Docker or anything else. It's all going to be taken care of for us through GitOps and Argo. Um, then we're going to deploy, we're going to fork repositories and deploy an app uh, of our own uh, through that. Uh, I don't need to talk about cloud native because we have, we're all here because of cloud native. All right. So, uh, tiny text. Um, is anyone here familiar with platform engineering or serves in a platform engineering role? Awesome. So uh, my definition of the platform or platforms is 
It's more of an ideal. It's an all-encompassing aspect that uh, gives us a framework that allows us to define how the IT organization should operate. It's not a singular code base. It's not a singular set of tools. It's a product-driven mindset to give the IT teams the tools that they need to collaborate together, hopefully in the same sandbox. Uh, is DevOps dead? DevOps is not dead. DevOps is just evolving. Uh, so the reason that platform engineering and the DevOps evolution and everything else uh, is so important today, uh, this is a chart I think from a Fairwinds report. Sorry if this, somebody looks at the recording later and I get this totally wrong. Um, but one of the biggest drivers for platform engineering, or at least the focus, is because our, the cognitive load for all of our teams has increased dramatically. And if we take a look at the CNCF landscape, it's absolutely horrifying how many different tools there are that do a smaller subset of things that we need. So we as platform engineers need to be able to go identify those tools, uh, provide specifications to our end consumers, which are those downstream IT ops teams, app dev teams, and those folks, and give them a better experience uh, so that they can do their jobs more effectively without having to think about all of these choices. Let's see. And I'm going to skip through some of this stuff. So this is a, a map that comes from the CNCF's uh, platform working group uh, white paper, uh, which you may have seen online today. Uh, so platform capabilities and platform interfaces are two important sections. Uh, today we'll be talking through the different interfaces we will use to interact with the platform, as well as uh, the different platform capabilities that we're providing. We're doing this workshop because we are going to put a core minimum viable platform in place that allows us to do the thing we need, which is let our app dev folks ship an app. So we're not gonna cover databases and some of the other uh, more complex concepts. You should already be able to do that uh, on your own. But uh, this concept of uh, providing a common interface between uh, product and platform teams and then uh, having capability and service providers and mapping those together is really the core um, of what we get out of this. It's our take home. All right. So, Infrastructure is code. So you guys are here for Terraform, but who uses Terraform today? Because you're either here to reinforce or learn from scratch. Who, who's never used Terraform? Okay, so we've got a few. You guys have computers? Ready to rock and roll and do Terraform? Awesome. Cool. Uh, so infrastructure as code uh, is our GitOps approach. It's the foundation of our GitOps approach for uh, how we manage our infrastructure. Um, with a GitOps approach, we're trying to define a desired state for our infrastructure, and we let Terraform do the synchronization to get us into that desired state. Uh, Terraform gives us an, a common interface that we can, um, oh brain, <laughs> and we can abstract away the underlying tools and have that common language, that common interface. So it doesn't matter what cloud provider, it doesn't matter what downstream tools or their platform tool tools. As an infrastructure person, I can just learn Terraform and then the rest of that is, is like Terraform is my gateway to these other tools. So I can standardize and learn on Terraform and not necessarily have to learn every tool in depth and every single tiny um, uh, individual abstract way to deploy that tool like doing Kubernetes the hard way. All right. Let's see. So uh, is everyone familiar with GitOps as an approach to a degree? If you're not doing this approach today, I absolutely strongly recommend it. If anything, just to be able to track and audit changes that are made to either your infrastructure or your applications. Um, we throw the term around single source of truth. Um, somebody made the comment today in their, in their flagship talk that it's not, Git is not necessarily a single source of truth, but I actually prefer to think about it that way in this uh, case. We as developers are used to living in repositories. We commit our changes, we push our changes, we do pull requests. So we're able to introduce that flow into the infrastructure teams. But most importantly, we can introduce Git as a common interface amongst other teams to do the same thing. So we can teach infrastructure folks, uh, DevSecOps folks, app dev folks. We can have them all live uh, in different compartmentalized buckets, which would be different repositories, and we can gate their access, but we're still using Git as a common workflow and a common interface. All right. Um, so. 
tools we, we're going to use in this workshop. Uh, we're not going to use Rancher Desktop, but I highly recommend Rancher Desktop. Uh, it's a good replacement for Docker Desktop, but it comes with K3, K3S already under the hood. It comes with Helm under the hood as well. It runs, uh, it has seamless installations on WSL, on Mac, on Linux, uh, everything that you need. It has a good graphical user interface. It has a local Kubernetes dashboard. It just comes with a lot of really good tools. And it's fully open source. Um, it's not a closed down product that requires a subscription. The licensing is all there. You're good to go. It's not going to get hidden behind a paywall. Um, but I replaced that with, uh, or Docker Desktop with Rancher Desktop and never looked back. From a developer standpoint, if I uh, have the tools to run my entire dev stack locally, then I can test and validate things in Kubernetes immediately before I actually do my, uh, my git commit, my git push, and that's invaluable. Uh, we will see Helm today, but we, will, we don't necessarily need to run it. Um, Terraform, we absolutely need to run and use. And then we're going to have Argo and Sivo. Uh, so Sivo will be our cloud provider, um, and Argo will be our GitOps tool for the application deployment side. All right, so this is where we actually jump in and get started with Terraform. After I skip through the portion of Rancher desktop that I'm not going to talk about because it's out of scope for this talk. But you can, you can reference this, uh, these slides and jump into that uh, later if you'd like. Uh, we're going to be using K3S under the hood as the Kubernetes distribution, deploying that onto Sivo. Uh, really lightweight distribution, extremely reliable and robust. Um, it's probably the most widely used distribution that we see today, and it's fully open source as well, which is really important. All right, um, Rancher is our Kubernetes orchestrator of choice. So uh, why do we deploy Rancher even though Sivo has a lot of additional tools? Uh, Rancher is a, a great management tool for Kubernetes. It runs on Kubernetes. It is not Kubernetes. It helps orchestrate Kubernetes. So under the hood, it's uh, completely unopinionated how it runs. You don't have to learn the Rancher way like you do some other company with a specific color. Um, so uh, if we leverage Rancher, then we can actually maintain a single control plane for Kubernetes and manage a bunch of downstream nodes. So in our Terraform, we will be Helm deploying Rancher into the cluster af after it's deployed. Let's see. Uh, so why is this important to us? I'm overlaying the capabilities of Rancher onto uh, this particular so slide. Um, Rancher actually gives us, out of the box, a lot of the platform capabilities that we would typically have to implement ourselves, including RBAC and single sign-on, uh, right? It does have tools for GitOps flows for deploying applications, even though we're going to use Argo. Um, it gives us policy management and governance, and then we have a bunch of additional tools that we can deploy in cluster or manage in downstream clusters for, um, for observ or observability, monitoring, storage, like with Longhorn, um, and other tools. So that's kind of like hitting the easy button for us. As platform engineers, we'd have to invent all of that stuff from the ground up. If it's already tightly integrated and we have something to rely on, then let's exploit it. Let's reuse it. All right. So we don't need to, oh, there we go. So we don't need to install Helm, so we're going to skip straight into uh, Terraform. So. Terraform is a command line tool, so we're going to be downloading and installing it today. Is anybody, uh, does anybody not have a Nix prepared environment? Linux, you know, run it on there? Cool. So we're good to go on that. So it's a, uh, do you want to say a few words about Terraform and talk about it a little bit? Yeah, go for it. You're going to cover it better than me. <laughs> um, yeah, so I mean, Terraform, we have been using at Sivo to do a lot of our deployments um, internally for, I think, four or five years. Uh, it's a really, really mature tool. Uh, it may have been in the press recently about a whole license change is where you might have heard about it, but I think it's still an amazing tool. Um, I don't think the license change is going to affect anyone in the room here. Do not be worried about it, right? Unless you're going to build a Terraform cloud implementation, which hopefully no one is going to do because it's a terrible idea to do, just use Terraform Cloud, you're going to be fine. So don't be shied away from, the, from Terraform. Learn it, use it. It's an amazing tool, and it's going to make your life so much easier. Um, I think the, the workflow that you go through with Colin is perfect to get started. And as he said, keep what you've got today running for the next 30 days. Go home, play with it, and, and run through it. All right. 
Uh, so advantages of using Terraform. So uh, Terraform is multi-cloud. It's supported by many different cloud providers, um, and it has first-class integrations with these cloud providers. They're probably all using it themselves under the hood anyway. Um, it's stateful as well. Now, um, the stateful aspect of this is something that's uh, highly opinionated right now, but for some teams, if it fits your workflow to, to try to maintain and synchronize that state, then it's the right tool uh, for the job. If you want to run fully declarative, then you might want to evaluate other tools. That's also why we're introducing Argo as well. Um, and just to highlight a quick note on that, if Argo is deploying and managing in cluster resources for us in a declarative fashion and with that GitOps approach, as uh, new tools like Cluster API come out, we'll be able to actually shift over to those tools and deploy and synchronize downstream clusters in that fashion. But Terraform is still important because we have to start somewhere. And if you saw the Cube First talk, we're huge fans of Cube First. Uh, it's a, it's an, I don't know that there's emplacement. There's a word for that. Um, it, it's a critical tool for bootstrapping your first clusters, essentially. All right, so installing Terraform. If you got the slides, go ahead and hit this link. Um, we're gonna start jumping into some hands-on and like kind of code first content and get out of the slides here in a second as well. Um, but this is the link here. So go ahead and start installing that if you don't already have it installed. And uh, who doesn't have it installed? So I can kind of track on that. Okay, cool. So go through that. Um, and I, I'd recommend using the brew install. If you're installing CLI tools manually uh, by downloading the binaries, you're gonna have to manage those manually as well. Just use a tool like brew. Just pick one. Yeah. Um, so at the back of the room in CV t-shirts, we've got Ian and Alex. Uh, they are real life SREs at CIVO. They do exist. Um, Stick, stick your hand up if you have any problems and they will jump in and help. I will also be wandering the room and helping as well. Um, please follow along and don't feel like if you get stuck that there are any silly questions or you've mistyped a command or something. Genuinely, we're here to help get you running and get you working and we all want to see you succeed. So just, just stick your hand up and someone will come and help you. Perfect. All right. So. Uh, are you guys good on the links? Everyone's. You need the link? Okay. Yep. All right. Just give me a wave when you're good. Uh, does anybody have any questions so far? I know we're kind of breezing through. What's our time look like? Uh, you can run a Terraform version, I believe. Yeah. Go ahead and keep rolling, because we can Google that one too. All right, so deploying the platform, um, what you're gonna need to do next, if you don't already have a Sivo, if you don't already have a Sivo account, um, is go ahead and register on Sivo. We have a special landing page for this. So uh, if you get asked for a credit card, you went to the wrong place. Um, so go ahead and visit Sivo.com slash Cremware. That's K-R-U-M-W-A-R-E. And it looks like this. That's what you should see when you visit this page. So it's gonna ask you for first name, last name, email. You can use your personal, I don't care, we're not tracking this, um, it is what it is, but it's gonna jump you right into a Sivo account. Um, the main reason we need this is we need to go grab the Sivo API key. So I'm actually gonna sign up for a new account right now as well and walk through this with you guys. All right. All right. So has anyone not seen Sivo? Sweet. 
All right. Uh, so that what we're going to do is we're the first thing we're going to do is go to settings. Now on Sivo, you'll see here as well that there's a lot of extra things that we can have that we don't need to manage our, on our own. Um, like uh, obviously KFAS as a service is awesome, uh, but our object store, so our S3 replacement, uh, our databases and our volumes are probably the three most crucial things that we need out of the gate with Kubernetes. So the fact that they're here at our fingertips is amazing. So we're going to go to settings and then profile. And then the security tab. I'm actually going to switch this over to dark mode really quick. If you didn't know about dark mode here, then now you do. That should be easier to see. So we're actually going to click the field under owners, and that will copy our API key. Uh, and then put that off to the side and keep that, because we're going to update uh, one of our Terraform uh, values files with that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's sivo.com slash K R U M W A R E. It's the I'll, I'll go back to it. Can you guys see that? OK, yeah. Cool. Everyone good? Uh, you guys might want to go ahead and grab the QR code for the slides and, and get the slides on your own machine. That way you can copy and paste some stuff. Uh, so I'm going to go back to the, the first slide there so you can grab that. If the internet cooperates. Yeah, why is it not loading? I'm one of those weirdos that like runs my slide deck with the rest of the slides open like every time. All right, there's the, the bit.ly QR code. Yes, there will be, we've got two or three. I'm gonna walk through them in the next uh, slides here, yeah. It's actually, I think, the very next slide. All right, is everyone good on slides? Gonna take that as a yes. Let's jump down. All right. So we jump through Sivo. I just moved a slide, didn't I? Did I just move a slide? <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, I was wondering whether like, that's a requirement in this to set dark mode. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is absolutely in the slides to set dark mode. That's a hundred percent. Really? Yeah. Oh, come on. Just call, get them to call me and I'll, and I'll yell. Why? Because you can't see regular mode in any presentation. That's just the one. Um, so the next slide, or maybe a couple slides later, is going to show um, a list of repositories here. Um, so there's a few repositories that are involved in this. Uh, and we're going to go over the concept of an app of apps uh, chart as well. Um, but the first one that you need is this uh, Crum uh, app dev platform starter, which is the first one. That's going to be our Terraform repository. So go ahead and clone that. And I'll open that up in GitHub so that we can take a look. We're going to use GitHub as an IDE today, which is actually kind of nice. You actually won't need it. Because if you use GitHub, you can just use the editor as well. But everyone has a GitHub account, probably. Oh. Challenge accepted. <laughs> yeah. You may need to create a Docker Hub account. If, unless you want to choose your own, then that's cool. But that, then you're a wild card. All right, so does everyone, uh, you guys know how to clone, repos, all that. I guess you need Git to clone, don't you? Oh, come on. Or you can download a zip. 
That's not, this workshop is just about fun, not about, not about Git. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good point, though. All right. Let's see. So I'm going to go over to uh, my IDE. Let's run clear. I've got some backup ones just in case. So you, that's why you'll see some additional folders in here. So git clone HTTPS. It's, yeah, you guys might want to be able to read this, huh? All right, so let me add this to my workspace. Let's go back, let's go back to workshop live. Okay, so in Terraform, uh, we have essentially, <laughs> what are the different um, aspects? So you've got modules files and your modules, your common modules are going to define the different tools that you wanna use. So you'll have modules for your cloud provider, you'll have modules for um, uh, Helm and some of the other tools, uh, and you can also define your own modules as well. Just to add to that as well, so if you're absolutely brand new to Terraform, um, Terraform files have this .tf extension. Um, it's kind of like YAML, kind of, if you know any sort of markup languages like that, you're gonna be absolutely fine. Um, it's an HCL, so uh, what is something, something language, HCL? There you go. Thank you. <laughs> so he's the expert, so ask him any questions. <laughs> um, so that's why you see if you're using an IDE like this, you've got the little uh, HashiCorp logo, Terraform logo that comes up so that it knows that that's there. It might be a plugin that you need to apply to get some nice completion and highlighting and things as well. Yeah, so I've already got all that stuff applied. For the sake of time, we're not gonna run through that. Um, so the first important step is, in here we've included a uh, terraform.tfvars.example file. Um, you can either remove the .example extension or, clone, or copy the, the file, but remove the, the .example from that extension. We like to include the .examples because we actually don't want to uh, we want to help prevent our developers, our infrastructure folks, whoever's using this repository, from committing their values and their secrets back in to the repository. So we usually get ignore the terraform.tfrs by default. So I'm just going to go ahead and edit that since I don't expect to. Where's the rename? There it is. All right. So in this file, we can see that we've already got, um, we have a few variables, it's really, really easy. We're gonna be using our email, an email address for Cert Manager. Cert Manager we're gonna deploy into the cluster so that we can generate SSL certificates. And then we've got our SIVO token and a SIVO region. Um, that's it. We're gonna use London 1 for our SIVO region. And then uh, in SIVO token, uh, paste your, the secret that you copied earlier. Hmm? Oh, no, it's not, it's not mine, it's free on Sivo, so <laughs> everyone can exploit it. Yeah, I'm gonna kill this account afterwards, so I'm not worried about showing you my secrets on this or the live stream. There better not be a way to reverse engineer it. I've got my eye on you. Yeah. All right, so I'm gonna use Colin at crumb.io. Send your employers my email and tell them that you need to work with us. That's your homework. Um, all right, so there's a few key commands that we're gonna run with Terraform. Uh, is everybody ready with the TF vars file? Good to go? Uh, two seconds, okay. First command is gonna be Terraform init. So Terraform init uh, is going to download the extra modules and dependencies that we've defined in our files. But um, just to show how Terraform is kinda safe, uh, I'm just gonna run Terraform plan, and it's gonna scream at me. Uh, I haven't run Terraform init yet. If I run Terraform apply, uh, it will do the same thing, and we'll talk about those commands. So I've got nothing here yet. Oh, wait, because I'm in the wrong directory anyway. Regardless, Terraform plan, now it's yelling at me that I don't have any packages or anything else there. This is covered in the slides as well if you're following along there. All right, so I'm gonna run uh, Terraform init as my first command. That's gonna, again, that's gonna download all my dependencies. 
All right, so we can see that that's downloading Kubernetes, kubectl, Helm, uh, the Sivo uh, module as well. Thank you, Sivo, for having a Terraform module. All right, so on my end, it says Terraform has been successfully initialized. So are, is, are they on that step? Yes. Cool. Next is going to be Terraform plan. Um, it's not required to run this, but it's a good habit to, to go ahead and run Terraform plan so that it can show you what's going to change, like what's synchronized, what's not synchronized, everything else. Um, quick note on that as well, when we run Terraform apply, which is the next step, if something breaks halfway through, we'll just run apply again because it's just gonna try to synchronize the things that um, don't match our desired state. So Terraform plan. And go. Come on, internet. Boom. All right. So we look good to go. We have 19 items to add, zero to change, zero to destroy. And then Terraform apply. So this is the part where we kick all the stuff off and install our dependencies. It's going to run plan again behind the scenes and then prompt me and ask if I truly want to apply these changes. Need the, yeah, do, 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 do. All right, uh, so we're gonna type yes, we do want to apply these changes. All right, if you're working in WSL and you get an error for a certificate, and for people who may be watching this later, and I see one Windows box maybe over there, um, clock drift, watch out for clock drift. That bites me just about every time. Your WSL can get desynchronized from your hardware clock, and it will cause certificate failures. So if you're a developer and you see that happen, that's probably what it is half the time. Um, so run a hardware clock synchronization. You can find that on Stack Overflow. Um, and everything should be honky-dory. So uh, what we're doing, uh, and one of the reasons why this Terraform is important, is we're actually creating all of the required things in, um, in Sivo that we would need. Like we're creating the network, we're creating the firewall, we're creating the cluster. We would have to do all that stuff and link it up manually, especially in a different cloud provider. Um, Sivo does a great job of not having us have to do that. But again, we're standardizing on a tool like Terraform. All right, so we'll see that this is uh, creating here, and typically I would hop into some other slides, but this should be pretty quick. So let's see what we got next. Is everyone getting a Terraform fly running? Does anyone need help? What did, that, what did you say? What did it? Oh, okay. Do you need the repo URL? Uh, I've got it, I've got it. Okay. All right, so we're going to go into the Sivo dashboard and check out what it's doing. I think this is the browser that I used. That's my login. That's a good call. Oh, did it, but the API key is the same, right? Yeah. Okay. Was that DG? Is that a new zone? Is that the announcement? That's the announcement. That's awesome. Cool. Look at that. Conference is working. All right. So we can see in Sivo, uh, we can browse and we can see that our Kubernetes cluster was created. Uh, it's not required. Uh, for this, but we can go grab that cube cuddle if we need to uh, and make manual changes uh, from this interface as well. All right, let's check on. All right, now in my Terraform, we can see that we're starting to apply some in cluster resources, uh, the first one being Cert Manager. So typically, we would have to install Kubernetes and then go install these tools on our own. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, sorry. I'm just a lowly app dev. <laughs> so, yeah, so the question there was about the Terraform backend, which is the state file. So what Terraform does is it keeps a cache of what is deployed 
locally in a state file. And then whenever you're looking to make a change or you're looking to apply, it compares what you want, so your desired state in your Git repo, against what it thinks is cached locally. And that's when you're doing a Terraform plan and it says one to change or 19 to create here. What it's doing is it's comparing this state file, backend file of no resources against the 19 that you want to create. There are options as you go and use this in production to host this state file not on your local machine. So this is where you'd be putting it in something like Terraform Cloud or into an object store bucket. And by doing that, you can now start having multiple teams working on the same Terraform repo. So team member one creates this and runs it and applies it and gets the state file pushed up into an object store. Team member two goes, oh, there is a change in the number of nodes in the cluster. They'd be able to make that change, increase the number of nodes, and next time you do a Terraform plan, you're using a shared state file and Terraform goes, everything's cool. If you have individual state files, you're basically getting into a fight where developer A or platform engineer A wants three, platform engineer B wants four, and you're just gonna be reconciling on top of each other and going from four to three, from three to four, and creating a huge number of page duty alerts and waking someone up. <laughs> And we'll actually look at, oh, we're actually going to look at the state file and pull some things out of it after this deploy as well. So it, it's where our, some of our artifacts are stored also, like uh, initial passwords. So for Rancher is going to have a bootstrap password, so it was automatically created for us by the Rancher installation. Um, we're going to have to grab that to log into Rancher, um, and that's one of the next steps. Um, so while that's going, I want to jump ahead to let you guys clone, uh, well, we actually don't need to clone one of the repos. Um, but let's see if I can jump into the slides here. Okay, let's do that. So um, mine has finished here. Uh, sometimes they take different amounts of time. Uh, so I'll continue to just give this a few minutes. All right, so while that's running, I wanted to kind of chat through just really quickly while, you're, while everyone's just wrapping up, um, just to rehash a little bit about the tools that we are deploying into this environment. So um, I don't think all of them are listed here, and we have a couple of hypotheticals. Um, in this particular case, our platform is everything you see on the screen. It's not Sivo itself, it's not a particular tool, it's not GitHub, it is just the fact that these tools are interoperable together and they're the tools that we have defined as this platform for today. So um, if I'm going from uh, maybe, if I do the top first, our app dev teams as an interface to the platform might use Rancher Desktop and by proxy something like Helm. Uh, we're probably going to use Git and GitHub as well. And we may use Docker Hub for image storage and manual pushes and things like that. Um, also, our app dev teams have access to some particular platform services. In this case, it's going to be Argo and it's going to be Rancher. And in some situations, uh, we also deploy in-cluster IDEs and Coder is a really, really interesting um, Kubernetes first uh, internal IDE that we like because it lets developers stand up templated development instances with predefined dependencies like your um, the programming language tools and things like that essentially VS Code instances. Uh, so those internal tools are obviously running on Kubernetes. Um, 
developers will also be managing apps inside of this environment as well. So if we take a look at the other side, and again, if we're thinking about that vertical kind of pancake stack, our infrastructure and ops teams are also going to use some of those platform services, so those become our sandbox, and they're also going to they're going to be the ones that use Terraform in this case. Our app dev folks will not touch Terraform, but our infrastructure and ops folks will as well. And I wanted to highlight New Vector also. New Vector is an open source Kubernetes native security tool. It runs heuristics and it protects east west traffic, north south. It's a really really great tool, and it is free. Um, unless you want to have us help you with support for it. So um, SecOps teams can actually use New Vector to have a, a security tool that looks and feels like what they're used to. And then New Vector will output YAML files for security as code that can then be committed back to the GitHub repository and will automatically make it in through our workflows. So if we inc include a tool for security teams in our platform like that, then it enables them to help participate in that workflow without handing over active tickets. YAML. YAML, YAML, yeah, or JSON. So there's multiple export options there, but essentially they're Kubernetes resource files. Let's see. And then Sivo is going to provide some additional capabilities as well, like S3 buckets, uh, databases, uh, volume management and mounts, and that's things that you'd see from other cloud providers. It's just not as cool. All right, so is everybody's Terraform completed? Well, shucks. All right. Well, for the sake of time, I got to keep rolling, but definitely help. Oh, did it? Did it just finish? All right. Uh, artifacts, output files. All right. So we've got a folder that's been created called output files. So that's an artifacts output files. What we're going to grab from there, you'll see a file that is um, rancher admin password. Uh, that's going to contain the rancher instance, so the URL that was deployed, as well as the initial password. So this is available via SSL IP, which is a great tool for providing uh, SSL certificates for uh, custom instances. It uses, uh, it sets your IP address or the IP address of the load balancer as the server, and then is subdomained with uh, Rancher in this case. So we're just going to leverage subdomains for several of these tools. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and log into Rancher. I have too many virtual desktops. All right. Then I need to accept the agreement for Rancher as well. Totally. All right, so Rancher is going to have a cluster view. In this case, we only have one cluster, and that's called the local cluster. So that's the cluster we're going to use. So if I go into the local cluster, if I can click, this gives us a Kubernetes dashboard as well, but this is more Kubernetes focused. Um, it's great to have something like Sivo to obfuscate that stuff away and make it easier for teams to serve. But in this case, I actually need to interact with this pretty closely. Um, again, just your uh, password and URL for your rancher instance is in artifacts, output files. What you're seeing in the rancher dashboard should broadly reflect what's in the SIBO. Yes. It, it, it will be very similar. You'll see some discrepancies for resources, but it's because um, Sivo reserves some resources for control plane management and some of the other tools, but that's desired. We actually want, when we're in Rancher, um, some of our users might not uh, want to know more about the underlying infrastructure, and if we virtualize some of that, then my, at me as a developer, I just want to know what's at my disposal. I don't want to have to think about it too hard. So it's great that it actually uh, kind of decrements that for us. 
So uh, in this case, we've again, it's all unopinionated under the hood. Uh, we're just gonna go find um, some information about the rest of our instance. Um, in this case, I'm gonna be looking for uh, my Argo CD instance. So my Argo CD instance, uh, we've created an ingress for, and for Kubernetes folks, an ingress is a way to uh, expose the service to the internet and essentially integrate with our um, load balancers as well as our uh, DNS providers. So uh, you'll see that your Argo CD instance is actually deployed to the same uh, SSL IP address. Just swap the rancher subdomain for Argo CD or launch it from uh, this interface. All right, so when I jump into Argo, uh, Argo is going to ask me to authenticate. You can also do this with um, single sign-on and do that integration and bake that in with your Helm or with your Terraform. Not going to do that today because everyone's different. So what we need to do is we need to get the initial password that was created. So you can either do this with kubectl or some other tools as well. Again, I'm just going to do this with ClickOps. So I'm going to go grab the secret from storage and then from secrets and I have an Argo CD initial admin secret. All right. So it's, um, if you already got into Rancher, you can go find it under uh, Service Discovery and then Ingresses in the sidebar. If you want a shortcut, just swap the Rancher subdomain for Argo CD. And then your credential is going to be what you just copied from the secret. And then uh, admin is the username. So username and then password you copied from the secret. Probably not going to have time for all the custom app stuff, uh, but you know I'm happy to continue to roll. So, but we're at least going to do the deployment here. Yeah. So I'm going to go back to the slides. All right, where's my app of apps? Um, we're, we are, we're going to get through our um, app of apps deployment here. So you're not going to actually, we're not going to have time to clone some things and go through that. Um, my apologies for that. But uh, I'm going to take you through what's called the app of apps pattern and let you know what that is and why that's important. If I can find my slide for it. All right. Okay. All right, so uh, is, has everyone used Helm before? Is anybody, anybody not used Helm? Okay, so Helm is essentially a rendering engine and package manager for Kubernetes. Um, if you're deploying Kubernetes resources, don't deploy them manually with the YAML files. It's great for if you're doing individual pods or deployments and some things that way, but uh, try to use or package things into uh, Helm charts. And Helm chart will give you a way to pass values into templates that you create that will then get rendered as those Kubernetes resources. It's really easy to use. Um, it's easy to, to run Helm create and get a bootstrapped uh, chart as well. Um, but why is that important in this context? So Helm has the ability to reference other Helm charts. If I'm a developer and I wanted to install a database, I go and find the Helm chart for it. But I don't want people who are adopting my application to have to go figure out how to install each of those individual components. So I need to create a Helm chart that references those other charts. I might do that with a standard Helm chart for one application, but what if I want to reference many applications and deploy and roll those out? I need yet another Helm chart. So in this case, um, Argo has kind of coined a pattern called App of Apps, where we're going to create a Helm chart that contains application, a collection of application definitions. Those applications are actually going to reference Helm charts and GitHub repositories or Git repositories themselves. Argo, as Argo CD, will monitor the Git repository, and if something changes, it tries to synchronize the state. 
as well uh, with the downstream Kubernetes resources. So we want to use the app of apps to define our collection of applications, and that can be in-cluster tools, that can be apps we want to deploy for a customer, maybe we're running a multi-tenant environment, that kind of thing. So in this case, we're just going to deploy a bunch of sample apps, like a Vue app, React app, Laravel app, uh, a bunch of different ones just from one Helm chart, and I'll show how simple that is. So this is a bit of a diagram there. Um, it's not blown up. So our chart loads. Our chart references charts and, and repositories for a number of different apps. It, this is a hypothetical. In this case, you might include Elasticsearch, Sentry, a bunch of in-cluster tools. So if you're an infrastructure person, you're probably going to toe the line between what goes in your Terraform or what deploys in cluster. Again, Cube First focuses on this a lot. What I want to do is I personally want my Terraform to be the bare minimum, and then I want in-cluster tools to bootstrap themselves and install themselves. So I can include this app of apps chart as a part of my Terraform. We haven't included that here because we want to do it manually, but that will also uh, cause these other complex applications to roll out and install in cluster. And with Argo, we can also define downstream clusters that can control deployment of this as well. So once you get your first one deployed, you're well on your way. Let's see, so we are going to jump several slides down. All right. There's also a concept of an umbrella chart, which I encourage you to read up on, but that's going to be more important to app dev uh, folks. All right. So in this case, we're also going to use Rancher, but you can use Helm here. So uh, we're going to be referencing a Git repository. You can go to this in your browser if you'd like. Um, it is called, uh, it's at crumb.io slash cloud native CICD starter. I'm just going to copy that. So if I go to that in the browser, we can take a look at what that is. And this literally will take about three more minutes. So in this case, we have several different things, and I wish we had gotten to the CI tooling here today, but we're going to focus mostly on this app of apps. So this app of apps chart um, is going to contain values that we're going to pass in, and these values that we've defined are a collection of other applications uh, that we want to deploy. So we're, you'll actually see we are templating the templates here. We're referencing. Um, uh, base repositories for Helm charts for a Golang app, React app, Vue app, Laravel app, um, and a, a Python Hello World app. We're passing in, we're saying the repo URL that we need to synchronize with is our cloud native workshop charts. We would have forked this repo if we were able to get through the full workshop. Um, and we're targeting a revision of head. You want to, in production and QA, you want to define a specific release. But since we're in dev, we'll just synchronize with that. Let's see. Um, our workflow CI. So the next stage of this workshop would have covered um, putting workflows in place to actually build the images, push those images, and then make a commit to a repository to tag that image version, which will then trigger our app of apps to synchronize uh, state because as we uh, change that downstream repo, it's no longer in sync. That would actually go back and roll our applications back out. It's magical when that happens. It's really cool to see. And it gives us a defined state and provenance. It says this machine user in Kubernetes committed this change to tag uh, a different image version for our app to this repository, which then caused it to roll out. It's awesome. So it all can be completely self-contained. In this case, all we're going to do is we're going to add this um, as uh, deploy this as a Helm chart in Rancher. So if I go to uh, Rancher, uh, I have the ability to install these Helm charts in Marketplace, much like Sivo. But I'm going to add my own repository, and that's going to be that Git repository. So I'm just going to call this App of Apps. And you could imagine if you've defined a really complex version of this, it's going to get rolled out to a bunch of different um, clusters. And you can manage all of those common cluster configurations in one place by managing that repository instead of having to go redeploy everything or resynchronize everything. So in this case, I'm selecting, oh, let me delete that. I always do that first. We're doing this as a type of a Git repository. And this is our GitHub repo uh, URL. We're going to target branch main because we don't use master anymore, I guess. Um, and then we don't need any authentication. So I'm going to go ahead and create that. 
That has added and synchronized this, uh, our Helm repository here. Now we're installing this as if it's an application in this repository. So if I go back to my slides where I outline this. So we're going to install this and we're going to install it into the Argo CD namespace. The reason we put it in the Argo CD namespace is for permissions and access. So Argo CD can access that particular file. Um, it will then deploy through definitions, it'll deploy these applications into a development namespace. So that gives us a declarative way to define how our environments should look in the app of apps. So if I go back to Rancher, I'm going to actually change, update my marketplace and search for my app of apps registry. And we can see here that we have two different things. Uh, the next step would have been to install our, our Argo Workflow CI tool, uh, same exact way. In this case, we're just gonna do the Argo CD app of apps. So you can see we have a readme here. It talks about the different um, apps we're gonna deploy, uh, the different things we're gonna deploy into the namespace. That just pulls from our Git repository. I'm gonna click install. Again, I need to select the Argo CD namespace, and I'll just give it a name. App of Apps is cool. And then I'm gonna click Next. Uh, we can see the values, so we could adjust that here if we want. And then I will click Install. Again, what that's going to do is that's gonna render uh, Kubernetes resource files and pass those into Kubernetes for us. And then Argo CD just updated to pull these application definitions. Now we can see that they're not ready, but uh, Argo CD is going to attempt to uh, synchronize those. So if we click into one of the applications here on the list, we can see that our deployment is beginning to roll out. We can see the different resource types as well. So the ingress, uh, the service, um, the service account, the endpoint slice, everything here that we would need to manage manually if we weren't doing this. Um, and as that synchronized, we see the image has been pulled. That now means that this application is available. And if I launch, this is where it's supposed to work, right? Uh, maybe it's still booting up uh, the instance, but we have an easy way to launch the apps here. Uh, we can also go view more information about this application. But the nice thing here is since it's trying to maintain that state, if I go edit that configuration or reversion that Helm chart back at the Git repository, everything just rolls out and stays in sync. It manages it for us. Now, this is a difference in pattern than we're used to. We're typically used to having a workflow that connects to our cluster and then pushes resources. This is actually allowing the cluster to make an outbound request, so getting through our security boundaries effectively, and then pull the resources in or self-create them within the cluster. That's becoming increasingly more important for software provenance to make sure that you have a clear understanding of the supply chain and where your tools came from. And for your own applications, this also means that we can build, push, deploy, and manage everything in cluster without an external repository or registry um, and have the tighter control of our resources. So, this is rolled out here. Now, uh, for further homework, uh, definitely you can follow through the remainder of the slides. Uh, feel free to email us or call us. We can hop on a video call and do the remainder of the workshop. Totally happy to do that. Um, but the next step would be fork this repository, change some references to make sure it references your GitHub account instead of our GitHub account to, so that any changes you make are properly synchronized. Um, and then you'll make a change to one of the apps, like the View app or the Golang app or something there. And then you can start to manage your app of apps and start to roll things out um, that way. Again, we're keeping those repositories open. It's totally free. We'll be enhancing those as patterns change so you can star those, watch those, do whatever, or contribute back. That would be awesome. Please do that. Um, but I think that's about it. So now, uh, as a recap, we have cloned a Terraform repo. Uh, we have installed Terraform, and we've uh, done a Terraform apply, which has created our cluster resources. So now we have an active cluster in Sivo with those resources deployed. And in cluster, um, we have uh, Rancher as a Kubernetes orchestrator. Uh, we have Argo CD, um, Argo Workflows is also in here. Argo Events is also in here. There's a number of other tools. Feel free to browse around Rancher and go discover some of those things. But we haven't had to, uh, besides the clone for the Terraform, really run anything. Um, besides that. Uh, Argo is a super useful tool. Um, 
but uh, after that, we deployed our uh, resources into Kubernetes. Argo saw those, responded to those, synchronized with uh, the registry or the repositories we defined as a part of those, and took care of the rest for us. So that's it. That's good. Cool. Any questions? Take that. Yeah, absolutely. So um, what you're probably looking to do is rather than use a PVC, is you want to create a PV or in the cloud provider, create a volume separately as a Terraform resource and then import a persistent volume with the PVC or that volume ID in. Then when you create a PVC, you reference the pre-existing PV. There's a lot of PVs there. but that basically creates the link to the pre-existing volume that's in there, and then your databases can start using all of the data that's already there. Okay. So to recap, a volume in the cloud provider, a PV, persistent volume, in your chart, and manually link that persistent volume claim, PVC, that your pod is using. Yep, and I'd, I'd recommend that as a pattern for your databases as well. Uh, databases is still a super opinionated, volatile thing about managing your own databases in Kubernetes, especially as you're managing the storage layer underneath. If you can leverage a cloud provider like Sivo to just take care of that for you, and that's the reason I'm really high on the fact that they have a managed database provider alongside Kubernetes, um, then yeah, use the provider, create the database there, and then just predefine your applications to link to that database as well. And if you need to move databases or shift databases, just go commit that change into your Git resources and have the application roll out. The other side of that too is we're changing the architecture of our applications. We're trying to make things more declarative. Um, that's the whole point of Docker and everything else. So there are ways to try to enable your applications to recover from that by like recreating uh, the database or recreating some things that we can kind of back up and repopulate later. But um, so yeah, I would definitely, that's where the fine line gets drawn for if I'm a platform engineer and I'm providing a service to a developer, my developer can create and cluster resources for databases and use those for development. But if we have resiliency and other business requirements, through that interaction with my app dev folks, I may say, cool, that's great. We're going to pull the database out of cluster and I'm going to provide you with a managed database that you can then use and consume. And that's when we get those platform conversations working effectively those as well. Uh, the, in this case, no. no. For, for Sivo, it does not. Right, but you still will need to do the persistent volumes, especially if you're hosting your own databases. But that's just common to, across every cloud provider. Yeah, and, and just to also add to that, there is a flag in Terraform that you want to use on the volume that you create, because you shouldn't click ops the volume creation. You should still create that volume in Terraform, and there is a allowed delete false or something. So when you do your Terraform destroy at the end of the day, that volume still stays there and it's nice and safe, so don't forget that one. <laughs> yeah, any others? Yeah? So, Laravel app didn't get the secret. So uh, in the full workshop, it's intentional. We want Laravel to be broken, and then we go and we update the secret value in the GitOps repository, and it rectifies. Uh, after it rolls out. So apologies for that. Again, I'm like, totally happy to go run through the rest of it another time. Cool. Any others? Cool. Everyone wants a platform strategy now? All right. Well, thank, thank you guys. Uh, we're done. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Bye.